Your Excellencies, esteemed moderator and esteemed participants, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning wherever you are. Welcome to the IPSS Indaba session, where we invite influential women to share first-hand experiences related to the realm of peace, security, and governance, and foster intellectual debate and exchange of ideas amongst the peace and security community. We had the first round of the experience as a woman head of state in Dawa session back in 2019 with Her Excellency Katrin Samba Panza, interim president of Central African Republic from 2014 to 2016. Continuing this trend, we will have the second session today here with Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Your Excellency, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It is a great honor indeed to have you here with us. Ms. Crystal Simoni, Director of Nawi African Macroeconomics Collective, will host this session. Ms. Crystal, thank you very much for moderating tonight's session and for accepting our invitation. Without further ado, I leave the floor to you. Enjoy the session, everyone. Thank you, Rubiat. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. And there was a slight echo, Rubiat, when you were speaking. I hope there isn't um, an echo when I'm speaking. Please give me a signal if there is one. Um, OK, I don't think there is. Uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. What an honor, what a pleasure um, to moderate the session of Af one of Africa's great um, I'll start off with a quote uh, by Wangari Mathai, who says, finally, I was able to see that if I had a contribution to make, I wanted to make, I must do it, despite what, what others said, that I was okay the way that I was, that it was all right to be strong. And those are the words from Wangari Mathai, who's been such an influence and such an inspiration for so many of us young women um, coming up in, in different ranks of power. And what a great honor to moderate a session with Her Excellency uh, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, first elected female head of state in all of Africa, and who holds a special place in my heart because she was one, an economist in a space where it's very hard for women to be an economist. Um, and I work in the realm of economics, and so I understand that. But also, she was exiled in uh, Nairobi from 1983 to 1985, which is um, part of the time that I, she was here during um, one of the years that I was born. And so I like to think that I shared the same geographic space as her for a little bit of, of my life, um, which feels like such an honor. With such vast experience, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, um, I would like to hand the floor to you to tell us a little bit about your experiences. What are your lessons? What are your challenges? As a woman head of state and the very first in Africa, you led, you navigated Liberia through the Ebola crisis in, 20, in 2014, 2016. Um, and the world is going through a pandemic. Um, and a lot of the lessons you learned and you've had a lot to share, um, but also just in general, your experience as Africa's first head of state um, and any ideas and lessons that you have as we sit at your feet, over to you. Sorry, President Sirleaf, you seem to be on mute. Okay. Better. It's a pleasure to be able to be with you to to share some of my experiences, but I also want to use this opportunity to to learn from you, to listen to you. Uh, and so as we talk, I hope it will be very interactive uh, so that we can both share uh, some of our experiences. You know, I always start by saying the road to the presidency is long. And particularly if, if it's a breakthrough um, goal that you have, as it was in my case, being the first, the first woman to, to reach that pinnacle. And I'd like to tell you in my case that it starts in my beginnings. I mean, your home, the, the values that are instilled in you by your parents, and how you conduct yourselves and 
the priorities and emphasis uh, that they place on your upbringing, mostly in terms of education. I, I always say that my siblings and I were guided by um, three basic values, which came from our mother. And I've tried to live with that. And that's honesty, hard work, and humility. Um, I did not start out wanting to be the president. I didn't say from the time I was a young girl that I would be president. Uh, but I did know that I had certain feelings of wanting to, to lead, wanting to take position, wanting to be active. And so throughout um, my high school, I tried to stand out, I, but I, I also in a way did some things that were different. I, I, tried, I, I challenged the status quo because I climbed trees and played football, those things that were really supposed to be the things that young boys do. Uh, but that also gave me a wider perspective of of what one could what one could do that you could do anything that you set your mind to, regardless of gender, of your gender. And and so I progressed and came to the place where, after taking position, I became an activist in society. And and even though I broke to for an education from time to time. Uh, but I think this start the road to the presidency, uh, really took its first route when, after I returned from college from the United States and worked in, in um, the public service. And, and but I, I started at a, at a low level position. I started as a director and then moved up subsequently uh, went back for graduate training and came back. But throughout it, throughout all of that, I took certain strong positions regarding what I felt were the policies of government and how they affected the society. In fact, that provided the basis for me to have gone for graduate school at Harvard University because of those positions I took. Uh, but then I returned. And national public service has been part of my strength. Um, and even though the, the periods when I was away from the country, I found small, I had a small foundation that reached out to people in different places as much as resources could afford. So I really became known to the public. And when I made the first challenge, um, and you, as far back as 1985, the first challenge uh, uh, to the to the government through through speaking, of course, it ended me in trouble, and so I, I ended up I ended up in prison, and and so I served prison time, and then went into exile and came back, and then went back into international service. Um, came back to challenge and I came one, one time again, once more I was challenging the status quo in society. And at that time I was challenging um, Charles Taylor, uh, who, who had taken over the country in way, and I lost. And that's another part of experience. You don't win all the time and you've got to be prepared to, to move on with the loss and to, and to, to, move, to overcome it and still retain your goal and still remain focused on your leadership agenda. So I lost in 1997. I was forced to go into exile again. Uh, and I served at the director, Some I served in some banking uh, operations for a while and then I became the director of the UNDP Africa Bureau and that also provided me the rich experience because in that position, it became for me a platform uh, because with that platform, I, I had the opportunity to, to interact with some government leaders or 
at, at all levels in society in those cases where UNDP had programs, I had the opportunity to visit with them. This built upon the opportunities I had when I served in as the uh, first African woman vice president. I lived in Kenya, Nairobi for a while. So that's why the road was long, but all those experiences prepared me, you know, for the position of, of being a president. And finally, of course, when we, when I returned uh, to challenge, one of the first things we were faced with was our country was in war. Uh, and we, we had the means to find how do we get out of war. Liberian women were very instrumental in that. They actually carried the burden, even when I was not in the country. Uh, they were able to challenge until we finally got to Accra and we had the, the peace court that led us peace and brought us back. And I started a campaign. I, but before starting campaign, I went back into public service. I served in the interim government. Uh, and that was some meaning of saying that no matter when you're away, no matter when you've been to prison, that those are things that do not stop you from seeing yourself as a part of a stakeholder group, seeing yourself as one that can relate and work with anyone. Uh, so it was easy when I came back to work with the interim government, to take a position, and then begin then to plan myself for the presidency and to run um, in 2005. And of course I was successful, but you know, I also went to battle for that because I was, <laughs> I was running against an icon, a football icon who had established his popularity so well in the country and beyond. Uh, what that meant is that uh, I had to, I had to have a vision. I, I had to be able to also use the strengths that I had. My strength was that I think I, I had a better education. I had better contacts. I had better knowledge. Uh, but to use that contact in a positive way, not a negative way, not to in any way denigrate him, not in any way. Uh, begin to engage in in dirty politicking, but to stay on the vision, stay on the message, you know, stay on the agenda that you have uh, and stay positive. And so we're able, and the women, you know, enabling me to find my priorities, and my priorities were twofold, women and young people. Uh, young people, because so many of our young people had left the country. And so many had never been in school, child soldiers. So we're going to reach out to them, both of them, the two segments, the professionals, the technocrats who, who had achieved an education, left the country, and all the many young people who never went to school. And to be able to find a way to for both of them to see and to have hope in the beginning that your presidency would make a difference in their lives. Um, we were successful. I was able to mobilize a lot of investment, resources, return of many of um, our citizens to the country. We didn't have much national resources. The budget I started on was 80 million US dollars. That's probably just the, the budget for, for your university. Uh, but we also knew that we could organize in such a way, not only to improve our taxing system and get more, but that we could build strong partnerships. And so one of our priorities was, of course, first and foremost, to tackle the whole thing about governance, putting in place young people who had the talent to manage the to manage the the areas of the government where we ensure that our priority ensured rebuilding school systems and health systems. The whole part of the infrastructure was part of it. We're also faced with a huge debt. Uh, five billion external debt that had not been serviced for decades. 
Uh, we knew we'd had no resources to, to do that. So debt relief became a vital part of uh, our, our first priorities. And that took us to a partnership because we were able to get our bilateral partners to stand by us on the debt relief, uh, to get our multilateral partners to be a part of that debt release. And because we're able to re- get the debt relief, we then created a fiscal space for us to be able to attract additional resources. Uh, we also broaden our partnership beyond national uh, uh, endowment and national resources uh, to be able to reach out to others. And so we were able to tap in to foundations that enabled me to start uh, uh, the uh, a market women fund in which we improve the, the markets for women to enable their kids to go to school, uh, to be able to start a Liberian education fund where we had clear targets about scholarship for, for, for girls, reconstruction of schools, uh, uh, teacher training colleges coming back. So those were reflective of, of um, all that we did is, is, you know, when you come into a country that as devastated as our was, when we took over, you know, our, econ- our economy had collapsed. Uh, our infrastructure was destroyed. Our institution was dysfunctional. So difficult to get priorities there, but you have to. You have to have priorities within priorities and look for some quick wins. Uh, Quick wins that will bring hope to people. Uh, One of the quick wins, which 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 would seem to anybody to be so infinitesimal, I mean, so small, was that uh, our country hadn't had had, um, um, grid lights for two decades. Uh, and I knew we didn't have the means because all the wirings and the poles and everything had been totally destroyed. So we formed a partnership with Ghana, the Ghana Electricity Company, and said, just let's get us little light. Let people see for the first time that you can get light out of more than a lantern or a candle. And so we're able to install a few street lights. And that, that quick wind brought so much hope to the young people who sat under the streetlights uh, to be able to do their homework and, and prepare themselves for school. Um, mobilization of resources. Liberia is a natural resource-rich country. Our endowment is good. It's just that we haven't had uh, the governance. We haven't had um, the success of using our resources for national development. And we were in the question of always having cycles of, of, uh, of conflict and war and destruction and rebuilding all the time. So this was another process of rebuilding. I was also faced with, um, uh, in our elections, most of the warlords were elected. They became part of the governance structure. And if you ask, how did they get elected, even though they were part of the war infection, whether it was out of fear or whether it was out of um, the manner in which they were regarded by their people because they lived with them. Yeah. We had to find a way to accept this uh, and to be able to manage the process at a time when expectations were so high. Uh, managing of those expectations on the part of everybody required patience, Compromise, tolerance, um, and then <laughs> progress is never linear. You can never be assured of progress. I mean, our our GDP had grown to the place where, by the time we reached the end of two thousand twelve, going into two thousand thirteen. We were having an average annual GDP of 7.5%, and on an annual basis for the last year had reached 9%. Uh, And we had done that despite the fact that we were also, like every other country, faced with the 
with a with a 2008 financial global financial breakdown and what that did but at the same time we were able to mobilize investment private capital investment uh to the to the tune to the tune of of um of 50 billion dollars initially and and so we we reactivated some of our major assets resource assets like mines like we're as a mining company like we're as a forestry company uh but to even reactivate some of those, we had to take some very hard decisions. In the case of forestry, we had been used as a weapon of war. Uh, we canceled all the forestry agreements, and we know that that meant going into court. But we had to have we had to be very strong about doing that. Um, and on the basis of our on the basis of our strong position that. Uh, the management of our resources prior to the new government had been mainly uh, the means of um, dishonest, corrupt practices. And so we could stand on that ground and the court ruled in our favor to be able to cancel agreements and get our whole forestry uh, started again. Uh, and then, as I said, when we reached this peak, when we thought everything was right, we had mobilized the resources for investment. We had restarted our mines. Um, our GDP was growing. Then Ebola hit. Uh, and everything stopped. Everything stalled. Our citizens out of fear began to leave the country. Uh, all the investment uh, was stalled because uh, people were so afraid, and we saw a GDP decline to the point zero from where it was. And for two years, we were battling not only trying to solve the Ebola problem, uh, but starting the process of of rebuilding again. By the time we reached 2016, because we brought the, we were on the Ebola issue. Let me say that um, here again, when one faces a crisis as a leader, is what do you do? Our first reaction in Ebola was to stop the movement of people, and that meant uh, military action. And so we put, we closed the borders. We put um, security to stop the movement of people, um, but we could not because our land mass are just free and people move around through the woods. So there's no way you could man every post to stop them. But what you did, what we did was to, to almost introduce fear into them because they felt they were being not allowed to run to safety. Uh, we knew very quickly that was not the thing to do, and we admitted it. We went to the public and said, we're wrong. Uh, militants said it's not the way to do it. We have a new approach. We're going to give the responsibility for fighting this to you, the citizens, in a community, through your community leaders where the tradition and the cultures are known and practiced, they can take responsibility to save their lives and livelihoods. With our support, of course, with our guidance, of course, with our leadership, of course, but that brought a sense of responsibility on the part of citizens. And that brought back the confidence that was required to get compliance with the measures that we had taken. And on that, we were very clear about three things. Uh, one was proper communication on the basis of facts. Getting the right information about the state of the, of the virus, informing them of it regularly and correctly, honestly, so they knew 
Uh, the second thing we, we had as part of our major program for fighting it was coordination to make sure that the different those with different responsibilities, the health system and others, were all speaking from the same knowledge, same information, with the same agenda and the same measures and policies that were being carried out. Uh, and then, of course, there was partnership. We could not have done this on our own. And so we did reach out to all our partners to talk about how we could do this. But combining those three things enabled us uh, to defeat uh, uh, the virus in, in record time and started the process of rebuilding. Um, and then we moved into, of course, by this time, uh, my own tenure, I was going into my, I was in my second tenure and being able to, to start the process of whether, you know, what, it, it had to cross my mind, having lost two years, was I to run again? Um, and I quickly took a decision. No, our constitution restricted um, into two terms. The second term was coming to an end and I had to obey the constitution. And so that took us, of course, into the year before the elections or the year of the elections. And that proved to be a very difficult year because at that time, uh, your whole agenda now uh, is now shifting uh, and those who are responsible for implementing the agenda are now looking at another future. So managing that process to be able to successfully uh, make that transformation and that transition to another elected government going through the process of the campaigning and what, what it is, again, takes, takes a lot of... Uh, a lot of temperance, uh, a lot of uh, understanding, and and the the ability to focus throughout the ten the tenure of a country that's moving from the state of war to a state of reconstruction. Uh, requires, requires a lot of patience. But moderation, and I believe perhaps, perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, being a woman, one could uh, be much more, much more determined in a goal, much less concerned about your own popularity, uh, more concerned about achieving the goals and the results, you know, that you have pr had planned. And that means taking a lot of beating too, because in a political environment, women will be hit. I mean, you can expect that uh, there will be those who will go to the media uh, that would try to do everything to, to you know, to, to challenge what you've done uh, to get false information on what, what your policies are, uh, to try to even say that, you know, as a woman, you, but I think we prove them wrong. We prove them that women can be as strong, as capable, you know, and as hard making when the time comes for hard decisions, the ability to do it. But still, we had empathy. That's a good part about women. In it all, that empathy of recognizing the value of humankind, putting emphasis on children, putting emphasis on the disabled, uh, putting emphasis on women. Uh, I think what the, the things that enabled me in what was very a male environment, Liberia is like every other African environment, it's a male environment, male-dominated environment, all of whom are just waiting. I sat in on uh, African Union meetings, and, and in my first meetings when I went there, there was always, you know, when you get ready to speak, you, in, you like you're under a microscope. I mean, because everybody's looking to see what you will say, 
how you will respond, what you will do, what you will wear. So, uh, so in those cases, all you have to do is to just again stand your ground, stay focused, stay to your agenda, uh, and just be strong. So, am I over my time? It's time for interaction. Yeah. No, you're actually perfectly within time. Um, thank you so much for for that for that narrative for giving us a glimpse into the more intimate parts of what it meant to be you know, President Johnson Sirleaf. Um, it's by no means a small feat. Um, you started off with talking about the tenets of hard work, humility, and honesty, and it's definitely um, threads that I see through your story coming out so, so strongly. The power of solidarity, beginning with the seemingly small things that begin to build and make a difference for citizens, the very citizens of which you have centered in your leadership, centering women, centering the youth, centering citizens in all the decisions that you make. But also as a young woman working on economic justice at a macro level, it's really interesting to see that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so as much as you battled with debt, we're still grappling with debt as an issue for so many African countries, especially now with the pandemic and trying to figure out how to navigate our countries out of it. But also challenge seems to be a constant theme in your story. But progress is never lineal but also the very, very strong message to keep the focus. Keep the focus is the most vital part of the story. And from all of this, really, as a woman in leadership, leadership doesn't have to be loud. It can be patient. It can be compromising. It can be tolerant. And it can be empathetic. And you really embody those tenets. Um, before I, I moderated the session, I was a little bit nervous. Um, and I spoke to my mom about it. And she says, well, President Sirleaf just seems like her aura is kind and nurturing. And you're definitely going to be OK. And so I'm going to tell her that I definitely was OK. And President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf does embody those, those tenets of leadership that are patient that are compromising, that are tolerant, and that are empathetic. And with that, we have a few questions, if I may. And the first question is from Taya Tafari. Um, we don't have too much time, so I'll take about two questions. Um, and he says, one of the biggest challenges for effective governance in Africa is endemic corruption. How can young women leaders of the future be inculcated with a culture of integrity and accountability? We have another question. I'll read the, them out and maybe they will merge. Um, from Solomon Belay Faras, and he says, I appreci appreciate Her Excellency uh, Sirleaf for her struggle in the male dominated world. How successful was she to infuse feminine qualities to your leadership, like the qualities of love and care? I think we spoke about that, but if you have anything else to add, um, please do, President Sirleaf. Again, the questions around young women leadership and how to um, embed really and inculcate a culture of integrity of accountability, especially in a world that is so heavily forcing people to do all the wrong things if they're going to make it in life. Let me say, you know, corruption is probably the biggest challenge that our countries face. In the case of Liberia, I had made an announcement in my first inaugural that, you know, we were going to fight corruption. It would, be, it would be our number one enemy. We would not allow. I did not realize the intensity of corruption in the society. It had become a culture embodied in all of our institutions. And because in the beginning days, most of our people had really no income. They had become the, to the place where they lived off their own ability for extortion. What we needed to do were two things. First was to make sure that we provided a living wage, proper payment to those in the civil service because they were part of the problem of having to receive bribes every time they had to sign a paper 
or be a part of anything. Um, and so whether we were dealing with our legislature who are part of the problem or dealing with the judiciary who are part of the problem or dealing with the executives, we made sure better compensation, better working conditions, reduce their vulnerability to corruption. Secondly, was to build integrity institutions. And that man, your general auditing office, had to be reorganized, restrengthened. Uh, we set up a, a corruption entity to be able to follow corrupt entities, to be able to identify where corruption was and, and deal with it. Uh, we set up special auditing system and in our financial systems to ensure that we move to full automation, to make sure that people could not play with the system, that they were properly there. Did we solve corruption? No, we did not. But what we did was introduce the means to lessen it and to provide the basis upon which it indeed could be managed over time. And so we left office with people feeling, yes, there's still corruption there, no question. But we have those institutions that continue to promote prevention of corruption. If our judicial system failed us in introducing the penalties for corruption. The, the other one had to do with women. Yes. Um, uh, the question was, how successful were you to infuse feminine qualities in your leadership, the qualities of love and care? I think to some extent we answered that, but if you have anything else to add, um, or if you'd like me to move to the next question. I think, I think what I stood for myself, and and the fact that uh, I made sure there were enough women holding strategic positions in the government and ones that were not common, like finance, justice, mm -hmm. foreign affairs, they were all women that inspired young girls, uh, that we went out into to villages and actually met with them, ate with them, drank with them, you know, sat with young kids and whatnot with families. I think that inspired uh, it. So um, I think the feminine spirit was, was always there. I mean, as a woman, it was always there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did not have to pretend to be a man. <laughs> you know, I could still be very firm in my decisions and, and let everyone know it's coming from the leader. You know, a leader can be a man or a woman with all the same qualities, the same capabilities, the same determination, the same performance. Thank you, President Sirleaf. We have a question from Hassani Soilibi. Um, what do you regret not having been able to achieve and what advice do you give to the new political generation, especially of women? And I'll add to this against the background of where the world is. Um, it's just January 2021 and we've witnessed already political upheavals ranging from the emergence of the Black Lives Matter into a global movement to the end SARS movement in Nigeria and, a, and democratic reversals in the wake of COVID. Where will global leadership to address these issues emerge, especially for women? I still feel that I did not achieve the level of bringing women into a legislative body, being able to help them win elections so they could take control of that. They could make the policies. They could be the one that would back me up. Um, concentrates on, on so many other things, you know, and women themselves being at this stage, uh, not really prepared to go through the hardships 
those who were professionals and technocrats were there. They were holding office and they were performing well. But being able to get some of them to break through the family barriers of running for public office, running for elective office, was where we were not able to get that full breakthrough to help them because they were always faced by their husbands that said, you already have a woman president, you don't need any more. You know, silly things like that. But, but you see how it resonates with them as, as an excuse to prevent women from, from being able to do something. But uh, we laid the groundwork. And through appointments, executive appointments, not only in the cabinet, but also in uh, local governments, you know, those who were what we call superintendents, which are governors in, in other places, mayors and whatnot, we were able to set forth the basis. So today, uh, now that I'm out, we are now running full force with women to make sure that uh, what I did not achieve before, I also was not, uh, I also was not able to, to solve the, the uh, FGM problem as much as that was one of my main objectives, but because uh, the cultural barriers were so strong. But these are, these are what I call my post-presidency agenda, <laughs> that, that I can now continue to work on those things. Thank you, President Sirleaf. And post-presidency agenda is a really packed. I follow you on Twitter and you're always so busy. Um, so congratulations. You set um, such a path and such an inspiration for so many of us. We have a very last question um, from Bethlehem. As an African nation leader, how do you balance superpowers, influence and policies through foreign aid and your people's and nation interests? Which is a really interesting question. I sit at the intersection of working with national policies, regional policies like at the African Union, but also global policies like with the World Bank and, and the IMF and so on and so forth. The balance between having to deal with our national issues around corruption and incompetence at that level, but then also having to face the challenges of interference with such a heavy hand by foreign powers. It's such a careful balance. And, and I have the same question as Bethlehem. How did you manage to balance these things and hold them off as you're able to build and rebuild uh, the nation of Liberia, especially considering that their purses go very deep at a moment of crisis financially? Um, it's hard to stand your ground, but at the same time, um, make sure that you're able to provide the help and the resources to be able to rebuild the nation? It's a tough balance, particularly when you're a poor nation. Um, because you need the resources to be able to achieve your goal. And most times those resources come with conditions. Um, but it's not that one has to succumb to their domination all the time. I think first your own agenda and goal must be clear and your policies must align with your, with your agenda and your vision. The ability then to carry them out fully like you want to is where the balancing comes because there will be pushback if donors feel that you're going too fast and too far and not recognizing um, the time it takes, then there's the battle. But at some point, one must just be strong when they go too far. And I think if you stand your ground in a meeting and there's something that they have wanted to change or to introduce in your program or your project and is going counter to what you believe is in the best interest of your country, you've just got to say no. This I will not do. 
then you run the risk of saying to them, take your money. Nine times out of 10, if your position is right in the national interest and is consistent with your agenda and you're firm in saying, don't follow my priority this time, take your money, chances are they will cave in. And I think many African leaders have reached a stage where um, they don't have to be subjected to the dominance of the World Bank. As a matter of fact, today the IMF and the World Bank are changing. They're changing because enough leaders have stood up to them to, eat, to be able to preserve and protect their own national interests against an interest that may be really reflective of the priorities of someone else. Again, one of the danger we face is the multiplicity of assistance. Like a poor country like ours, everybody wants to help. And so they all come with their all priorities. They want to build a school, they want to build a clinic, they want to introduce you know, some human rights thing. And you find yourself sometimes in a difficult thing. They build a school, but they don't tell you where, where you get the teachers, where you just training teachers because you don't have teachers, or where you're going to get the materials to ensure that the school is, is functional. So it's those things that you, you have to continue to battle um, to make sure that. But today, again, we've come a long way where people are now talking about aligning all the programs, even of NGOs. And NGOs can be also a problem because they have their alliances and their support externally. And those alliances have their own views of what is best for you. <laughs> you have to battle them too to make sure that you keep them in line. Uh, we had a co coordinating mechanism where I chaired a meeting once a month of all the major donors and partners to be able to remind them of what our agenda was and that they are supposed to respect our agenda. So that that kept them all the time, you know, in line of not going too far. Um, Thank you, President Ellen Johnson. So, Liz, I think we've come to the end of a very rich 45 minutes. Um, thank you for weaving such a warm, um, honest story about your journey as head of state, um, as the first woman head of state on this continent. Uh, you've opened the doors for so many of us. Um, you've shown that it can be done. You've shown that it can be done with hard work, with humility and with honesty and we thank you, we honor you. Um, we continue to follow in your footsteps and thank you for being so gracious. Thank you for teaching us that, you know, and I say it again, just to end this, leadership doesn't have to be loud and violent and overbearing. It can be patient, it can be compromising, it can be tolerant and it can be empathetic as you have so greatly shown. Um, so I stop here. I say a very heartful thank you for your time, for your grace, and I pass back to Rubiat um, to close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, forgive me as uh, my connection is a bit unstable around here. I had to turn off my mic. Your Excellency, allow me to thank you wholeheartedly for being here with us and to give us this experience you've gone through. And also, Crystal, for moderating the show and for making it so live. I would like to kindly ask all of you to fill out a short survey uh, that we will uh, share with you after the session. And would like also to thank our partner, GIZ, for their support. And we will see you in our next session, which most probably will be on the post AU uh, outcomes of the AU Summit. Have a great evening, everyone, and thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Excellency. <laughs>